much. I'm delighted to be here and to moderate this very really exceptional panel. I'd like to uh, first start by introducing Dr. Sarah Scarlett. She is a newly minted trauma surgeon with a strong interest in surgical ethics. She recently completed a surgical critical care fellowship at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She completed the ACS Surgical Ethics Fellowship at the McLean Center in 2017 to 2018. This month, she will be starting her academic career at The Ohio State University in Columbus. She's interested in the intersections of trauma surgery, public health, and ethics. She studies the ethics of healthcare for justice-involved patients. Welcome, Dr. Scowett. Thank you so much uh, for the invitation to present today. I'm very excited to um, help kick off the conference. When an incarcerated person becomes ill, experiences of receiving healthcare are quite different than those of non-incarcerated patients. After the decision is made that a person needs care outside of the correctional setting, they're brought to a non-correctional hospital. Oftentimes they arrive and they wait in rooms hidden from view, such as this decontamination room in an emergency room. They are often transported around facilities using alternative routes and entrances. In main areas, their shackles are hidden by blankets. Correctional officers maintain presence at the bedside and patients are shackled throughout the entire admission during scenarios such as general anesthesia, critical illness, and even parts of labor. Experiences like this are common. And that's because today, there are 2 million people incarcerated in America's prisons and jails. Not only do we incarcerate an enormous number of people, some communities are disproportionately affected. And many people believe that racial health disparities in America occur in part due to mass incarceration. The relationship between incarceration and health is complex. Incarcerated people have a higher prevalence of infectious diseases such as HIV and even COVID-19. They share a higher burden of mental illness, substance use, experiencing witnessing trauma, and even things like traumatic brain injury. Incarcerated people are physiologically older than their non-incarcerated counterparts. At some estimates, um, their physiologic age is about equal to 10 to 15, or people 10 to 15 years older in the community. And some forms of incarceration, such as solitary confinement, actually lead to worse health outcomes. In 1976, the Supreme Court ruled that deliberate indifference to the serious medical needs of prisoners constitutes cruel and unusual punishment in violation of the Eighth Amendment. And with this ruling, incarcerated people became the only population in the United States with a constitutional right to some basic forms of health care. For incarcerated people, understanding how healthcare is delivered and the quality of this care is very difficult to determine. This is because there are many different systems of incarceration. People are also cared for at multiple types of healthcare facilities inside and outside of correctional facility walls. And there's little data collection regarding health and healthcare. And much of the data we rely upon is actually self-reported by incarcerated people as with the 2004 survey of inmates in state and federal correctional facilities, which is the last national study of the health needs of incarcerated people. Scant data does suggest, however, that the burden of care is significant in terms of cost and need. An estimated $8 billion was spent on prison health care services by the DOC in 2015. And in some states, the health care budget for corrections approaches one quarter of their total operational cost. Many people require this care, as in North Carolina, where nearly 1% of people were hospitalized at some point during their confinement. There is some data that suggests healthcare disparities for incarcerated people, and these exist mainly in the qualitative literature. There are exceptions to basic attributes of patient-centered care, such as physical comfort, health privacy, and informed decision-making. Nurses describe correctional officers and shackles as inciting fear and posing barriers to forming therapeutic relationships with people. And fundamental misconceptions have been observed regarding advanced care planning for incarcerated people, posing significant barriers to providing quality palliative care. And in some studies, trainees actually believe that incarcerated patients receive substandard care. Some of the most compelling data comes from incarcerated people themselves. Now the slide isn't advancing again. There we go. As in this qualitative survey published last year, when you're a prisoner, you have no medical competence. It's open information for everyone that's there and you just get cut out. 
And after a while, they don't talk to you. They don't see you. They see authority of the prison officers and they bow down to it. For non-incarcerated patients, many guidelines exist that guide healthcare and influence reimbursement and accreditation of hospitals. In comparison, there's little guidance on appropriate care for incarcerated people. Many regulatory agencies have fallen silent on the care of incarcerated patients, such as CMS, who explicitly exempts shackles from restraint requirements, and the Joint Commission, who retracted requirements for hospital orientation for correctional officers in 2017. There are some guidelines related to the care of incarcerated patients, most notably those related to the care of women during active labor. Um, but of these guidelines, many relate to care within correctional facilities, not outside of them. So when a clinician sees an incarcerated patient, what guides their decision-making at the bedside? It's likely a multitude of factors, including ethical frameworks, convenience, and their own preferences or biases. Myself and my colleagues became very interested in what guides the care of incarcerated people. And as we chose to study this, we became inter interested in institutional policy. So why study institutional policies? Generally speaking, they help us understand what we can and cannot do in the hospital. They tend to be referenced in times of confusion, and we know from the literature and anecdotal experiences that clinicians are often unsure of how to care for incarcerated people. Importantly, policies convey what an institution believes is ideal behavior, or in the case of incarcerated people, ideal treatment. Policies may contribute to individual practice, but this is likely variable. Hospital policies have broad implications across health systems and populations. And each hospital can have hundreds, if not thousands, of policies. And despite this, there's little written in the literature regarding ethical analysis of these policies or suggested review processes. Some authors have even um, moved as far as to criticize institutions with policies that fall silent on important issues. Reflecting on this, we became very interested in institutional policy related. We developed three main questions about the content of these policies. What is the role of hospital policies in the care of incarcerated patients? How do the policies identify varying content and tone? And are the policies contributing to structural bias? We evaluated a, conven we evaluated a convenience sample of policies across a large healthcare system in the southeastern United States. We used a policy search uh, engine through the institution using seven search terms, inmate, prison, prisoner, forensic, incarcerated, incarceration, and jail to identify these policies. And a code book was developed with the input of four reviewers with experience in clinical care, ethics, and care of incarcerated patients. We identified 106 total policies, which came from 10 hospitals throughout the system. Of these, there were 19 policies that had a primary focus on the care of incarcerated patients. On the right, you can see for that for the policies are the primary focus on incarcerated patients who the authors were. The most common authors were nursing administrators and hospital police. We observed a lack of consistency among hospital policies, and there was no general policy related to the care of incarcerated people throughout the health system. And this is really important because for people in our system, incarcerated people were cared for at a variety of institutions, and based on the policies, their treatment could vary significantly based on which hospital they were brought to. There was also a lack of interdisciplinary input. With regard to authorship, there were no patient representatives and no physicians were um, involved in policy creation as far as we could tell from our review. We also noticed wide variation in how the policies um, described and discussed people who were incarcerated. Here's a collection of terms we identified that were used to describe people. Many terms are not consistent with recommendations for person-first language. And some terms, such as correctional and inmate, have actually be, been identified in the literature um, and discussed by incarcerated people as being derogatory and stigmatizing. We identified five major categories in our analysis in our code book. Facility security and safety, including what to do if a patient escapes or becomes violent. Administrative processes, those mostly related to coordination of care and billing. Clinical services, um, such as those, uh, including services provided to patients, including things like nursing care, phlebotomy, or transplant. Non-concurrent standards of care with specific recommendations in which it appeared to us that incarcerated patients care deviated from the standard of care or patient-centered care. And then patient rights, which related to things like policies handling surrogate decision-making or consent. 
This is a chart depicting the frequency of major categories and policies. Major category is on the x-axis and the percent of policies is on the, or major categories on the y-axis and percent of policies containing these codes were on the x-axis. And you can see that facility security and safety was the most commonly um, used category, whereas patient rights were the least commonly used category. Now I'll share some excerpts from the categories to give you a better sense of the data. This quote relates to the care, to the care of incarcerated people who die while in the hospital. The custodial agency is responsible for notification of the prisoner's next of kin, and restraints will remain on the prisoner patient until the prisoner is observed by the county medical examiner. Some policies did acknowledge that despite incarceration, patients retain the rights to consent or refuse treatment. Even so, these policies acknowledge limitations on these patient rights, saying things like access to treatment and to their authorized representative are subject to special procedures. In the hospital, significant discretion was left to correctional officers at the bedside. In these policies, they were given authority on a wide variety of topics. What items a patient could have at the bedside, and even given the ability to do things like sign a patient out against medical advice. Perhaps the most illustrative category was non-congruent standards of care, and we noticed three distinct themes here. Restriction of physical space. Policies prevented patients from walking without the order of a physician. They were not allowed to have items in their rooms, even items typically allowed in correctional facilities such as books or pictures. There were modifications on clinical care. Patients were unable to communicate with family members or surrogates, which is commonplace for people making decisions about their health. Patients were not able to be admitted to certain units, such as the pediatric ICU, irrespective of age, and they weren't able to do certain clinical tests, such as the six-minute walk test, um, which is important for determining a patient's ability to have supplemental oxygen out of a correctional facility. Their diets were restricted. They were unable to choose what foods they were served and rather served a prison tray despite health concerns or dietary needs in the hospital. The policies also dictated significant modifications on staff. Clinicians were not allowed to directly contact patient family members or surrogates. And one theme we encountered frequently was that non-correctional staff were asked to perform security tasks, such as nurses securing rooms prior to the arrival of incarcerated patient. And the opposite was also true, where correctional officers are given clinical roles, such as monitoring skin underneath shackles or other restraints. And we felt that these policies often required people to act outside of their scope of practice and training. Some policies even explicitly discuss that shackles and other restraints used for incarcerated people are not safe and appropriate healthcare restraints. Reflecting on these policies, we found that many contain specific language noting that incarcerated patients should receive the same care as non-incarcerated patients. But these were often in the same policies that delineated limitations and modifications to this care. And in our view, the policies failed to reconcile a desire for patient-centered care and for preserving facility security and safety. To us, the result of this was creation of a false dichotomy in which policies attempted to separate clinical care and security concerns. But the distinction is often cloudy. When one takes a more holistic approach, elements of in-hospital care that were categorized as security don't seem that way, such as what a patient eats or how and when we talk to their family about their care. And we suspect this false dichotomy is a source of tension and confusion for staff. Unfortunately, some of the policies seem to codify bias, sti stigmatizing incarcerated patients. These policies reference people as manipulative and even warn staff against forming relationships with them. Other policies use derogatory language to describe incarcerated people, calling them things uncooperative, abusive, or insolent. Language such as this could further support bias and lead to poor treatment. In conclusion, Incarcerated people often require health care in non-carceral settings. And unfortunately, there's little guidance for clinicians caring for patients in these settings. And studying hospital policy can offer insight into disparities in care and structural bias experienced by these patients. As we reflected on this study, we couldn't help but think about what policy could do for incarcerated patients and other patients with vulnerabilities. And we believe that policy should be written in a way that promotes health equity. Unfortunately, many important factors related to the care of incarcerated patients were not mentioned in policies, things like advanced directives, compassionate release. We believe that this is a missed opportunity, and at best, policies can and should be used to set a respectful tone, acknowledge vulnerabilities and protect patients 
reduce staff conflict and confusion, and engage in interdisciplinary collaboration. In recent years, there have been increasing calls for justice for incarcerated people, specifically to end mass incarceration and its negative effects on people, their families, and their communities. Some of the most longstanding cries for justice have come from incarcerated people themselves. 50 years ago, the Attica Manifesto written by incarcerated people demanded access to quality health care in which patients didn't experience prejudice. Perhaps it's time we listen. I want to thank my brilliant collaborators, Shannon Gillespie and Elizabeth Dreesen and all of my mentors at UNC and McLean. Thank you so much for the opportunity to present and for putting up with my technical difficulties at the beginning of this talk. Thank you so much, Dr. Scarlett. That was an amazing presentation. Um, and despite our crackerjack team of technical uh, assistants here, we, we uh, had some issues. Um, so thank you everyone in the audience for your patience. Um, I want to make sure that uh, everyone knows that we are not doing a Q&A after each uh, presentation. We're going to save them all for an open Q&A at the end. We'll have a robust 20 minutes. Um, and so if you can um, take the time to enter your questions as we go along so you don't forget, um, it'll help us um, have um, just all the questions sort of lined up at the end and help me moderate the session. So thank you again, uh, Dr. Scarlett. Uh, next, we have Dr. Marshall Chen. He is the Richard Perillo Family uh, Professor of Healthcare Ethics. He is also the Associate Director of the McLean Center for Clinical Met Medical Ethics. He's a Senior Faculty Scholar of the Buxbaum Institute for Clinical Excellence at the University of Chicago. He co-directs the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation's Advancing Health Equity, Leading Care, Payment, and Systems Transformation Program, and he was also elected to the National Academy of Medicine in 2017. Marshall um, also has a totally another side to him. He's a member of uh, what's called the Excited State. It's an improv improvisational <laughs> comedy troupe. He's trained in improv and stand-up comedy at the Revival Theater here in Chicago um, at Science Riot and Cold Tofu in Los Angeles. He and his colleagues use improv and stand-up comedy, storytelling and theater to improve training of students in caring for diverse patients and engaging in constructive discussions around systemic racism and social privilege. He'll speak on the stand-up comedy and the personal monologue to explore interpersonal bias. Welcome, Marshall Chin. Thanks very much, Monica. And Eric, do we have slides showing? I, right now I see just myself on the screen. Great, thanks very much, Eric. And so I'd like to recognize my collaborators who are co-authors on the paper that's currently under review. Mona Abermishan, who's a professional stand-up comedian and one of my stand-up teachers and mentors, and Mengxi Zhu, who is a statistician and data analyst. And so I'll first tell you the story of like how we started using stand-up to teach about health equity. The story begins about five years ago. I had given my wife, Nelko, as a gift, a, a storytelling class at the local theater, The Revival. This is uh, on Woodlawn and 55th, right next to Jimmy's Woodlawn Tap. And at the end of the quarter, The Revival has a student show of all their students. So the storytellers, the stand-ups, the improvisational comedy students. And I remember like in the student show, the first two students to perform were the stand-ups. And I was thinking, there's, there's no way in heck we're gonna do that. It looks way too intimidating. The next students were the improv students. And my wife and I thought, hey, that looked like fun. And so we started in, to enroll in the Improv 101 class, had great teachers, great fellow cohort students, ended up doing the complete five course sequence at the revival. And as I got more into improv, I began to realize that the skills you learn in improv really are great skills to have in other professional uh, lives or career development in general, as well as for patient care. The most important improv principle is yes and, which basically is be a good listener. 
So yes, you agree with what your scene partner is saying, and then you build upon that reality that your scene partner has started to create. But we're also taught critical to build relationships with your scene partner and important to make strong, bold choices. And so about a couple of years ago, I had a paper come out in John Maternal Medicine entitled Lessons from Improv Comedy to Reduce Health Disparities. And it talked about how the arts, and in particular improv and stand-up, have potential for health equity training. Uh, the arts in general help us understand human experience. They help us connect with people directly. And then you know, this challenge of how do you teach about emotional and cognitive intelligence I can think of a, a few things better than the arts or something like improv and uh, stand-up to teach about emotional intelligence. And so uh, Eric Topol, who at that time had 291,000 Twitter followers, tweeted out a line from the paper, I, I can't believe that you're doing improv comedy, but it's a good thing that uh, he did. Uh, and the paper ended up getting um, a lot of, um, of dissemination, probably one of my two papers I've ever written that's gotten the most attention on social media. It had about a million Twitter impressions. So it seemed to resonate in terms of the audience. And uh, we, we, my wife and I had good timing that when we had finished the improv sequence, the theater was starting a house improv team, a science-based team called The Excited State, where uh, besides the, uh, the, the true performing, each monthly show, uh, we have a, a faculty guest, often from the University of Chicago, who will give a brief presentation on the research for the lay public, as well as participate in some of the improv games. From the McLean Center community, uh, we've had as guests uh, uh, Monica Peake, Stacey Lindau, Albert Huang, and um, we're hoping that um, we're going to get noted improv comedian Mark Siegler on deck, uh, potentially for July 2022 when the new fellows come in. Um, uh, Dr. Siegler has a very busy uh, international tour, so he's been hard to book, but we'll be, uh, we're in touch with his people, and hopefully this will become a reality. Um, and then um, some of our improv buddies got into stand-up, and they basically convinced my wife and I to do it. And so this is the cohort, uh, this Motley crew, this is the cohort who we did the, uh, the stand-up training with and started hitting the open mics uh, circuit uh, in Chicago with. That's me on the left there in between Cuddy and OC, and my wife Knuckles in the middle next to Mona. And uh, stand-up is different from the improv, that um, stand-up, these are scripted, rehearsed, jokes and, and, um, and um, statements. And some of the key qualities of a successful stand-up are being authentic, a willingness to be vulnerable, and willing to talk about the personal lived experience. And so you start to think, see how like some of these skills could be very useful then for difficult discussions about bias and, and racism, for example. And so uh, before the pandemic, we started hitting the open mics. And so this is like uh, Reggie's on the left on, on the south side and Jimmy's on the right. Uh, we did some large venues. This is the Den Theater on the north side. Um, my longest set to date has been a 15-minute set at Comedy, the Comedy Bowl, north side. And then uh, uh, Ward, uh, Ward 5, uh, our Ward uh, Alderman, Leslie Hirston, she has an annual laughter and local politics event. And at this most recent event in February, uh, Mona and I were the two comics to perform. We had 10-minute sets. And um, after we performed, we actually did a variant of the exercise. I'll describe the rest of this uh, presentation uh, with Alderman Hirston and uh, one of the audience members uh, to really get into this issue of a discussion about identities and, and biases. And it went well in that particular setting. And so Monica has been one of my uh, uh, biggest uh, comedy supporters. And so she tweeted out after this that I, I got at least her laughing while tackling the very serious issues of implicit bias and racism. And I, I discuss issues of bias and racism in most of my stand-up sets, and I found it to be a, a good way to get people thinking about these difficult issues. And so uh, Mona and I actually came to very similar I ideas from different starting points. For me, um, the, my prior project that has most influenced me in this sphere is uh, a project aiming to improve communication and shared decision-making between clinicians and LGBTQ people of color. And so from that project, Monica led this terrific paper uh, where she developed a conceptual model for this. And so on the left, you see that there's the, the clinician and patient talking to one another. There's the spoken word, but equally important is what's at the top, you know, what's in their heads. They're not saying this, but there are the thoughts they have as I, as a clinician, try to size up the patient. The patient is similarly trying to size me up. 
And these views are, are, aren't pure views in some ways. They're tinged by um, um, stereotypes and biases. In some ways, like, it's very hard for each of us ourselves to have a clean view of ourselves because we see things through the lens of society's uh, perceptions and the values that society places on, for example, a different racial ethnic group, for example, in the media images and how, how groups are portrayed uh, publicly. Monica and uh, Monica Vella and I, we had a paper come out about a year ago in academic medicine, practical lessons for teaching about race and racism. I'll point out three, upper left quadrant, the importance of creating a psychologically safe learning space, upper right quadrant, second bullet, the importance of starting with stories, not numbers. We've often found that if we start an equity talk with uh, statistics, uh, people can tune out as opposed to starting with the story and bottom right quadrant. The importance of engaging in free, frank, and fearless discussions about structural racism, colonialism, and white privilege. So, uh, if regardless if you're an international uh, stand-up professional comedian like Mona, and she's amazing, she she performs throughout the UK, uh, European Union, South Africa, the Middle East, all throughout the U.S. Or if you are uh, someone beginning their stand-up journey, like myself. Stand-up has the same challenge of having to read the room, so read the audience, to be able to target things for the audience at that time, and then being able to read yourself in terms of your self-understanding. And then just as the clinician controls the room in the patient encounter, similarly, the stand-up has a lot of power. The stand-up controls the room during a performance. To, as far as we are aware, there's no pre-existing literature on the use of stand-up comedy to teach about uh, advancing health equity. There is a literature on stand-up and anti-racism. So, for example, there was one study, a qualitative study of Midwestern comics, which uh, found that successful comics share honest, revelatory personal experiences as a prelude to thought-provoking jokes about racism that challenge stereotypes. No one can deny how you perceive yourself and the audience getting to know you is the setup for dialogue around racism. So about a year ago, uh, we had a, a great team of, of uh, colleagues who did a pilot with the entire first year Prisker medical school class. So each member of the class did two out of the following four art forms, stand-up, improv, graphic medicine, that was led by uh, Brian Callender and Shirlene Abobi, uh, Theater of the Oppressed, as part of the required health disparities course that Monica Vella led. And each of the students did these 90-minute Zoom workshops. The student to teacher ratio was about 10 students per instructor. At the end of the class, uh, there was a quantitative survey with Likert scale questions, which also had open-ended questions. For the 40 stand-up students, there was a 42.5% response rate on the survey. The specific learning objectives were to humanize clinicians and patients, improve listening, observation, and empathy, and to recognize how diverse patients perceive you and how you perceive them, in particular for the stand-up uh, module. Uh, more aspirational over time is to engage in these free, frank, fearless, and safest conversations about structural racism. Before the class, we sent the 40 stand-up students this email which said, together we'll use principles of stand-up comedy to help you read the room and read yourselves, critical skills for caring for diverse patients effectively. A comedian's job, like a physician's, is to always leave the room feeling better. So we will create a conversation exploring how might thinking like a comedian help generate innovative skills for patient care, leadership, and life in general. And at the top of the workshop, we set a few grand rules. First, you don't need to be funny, and that really the workshop was not about comedy or being funny. Second, we don't want anyone to feel comfortable, so no one had to do any exercise if they felt uncomfortable. We said, for example, that it would be fine if someone observes and then perhaps just contributes to the discussion and comments. That'd be fine. And then third, everyone should feel comfortable disclosing as much or as little about themselves as they feel comfortable. The workshop consisted of three exercises, a fun naming exercise to learn each other's names. We then did a classic improv uh, uh, exercise called Rant and Frave. Each student was given an object and was asked to either rant about why they, they hate that object or rave about why they love it. The key exercise was a personal monologue, which is actually the very first exercise uh, I had um, been taught in my um, stand-up 101 class taught by uh, comedian uh, Jonah Jerkins. And then here's the key exercise, the personal monologue. We explained to the students, we'll be exploring our own personal monologue by first thinking and journaling for five minutes. Then volunteers would do 90 second maximum monologues. Students were asked to choose one of the following three options. Almost all the students did option one. 
which asks them to think about how do others perceive me when they first meet me? What do they get right? What do they get wrong? And so uh, we did the workshop, and then I'm going to show you first the, the quantitative data. So uh, um, the point about this slide is that you see mostly green. Green means agree or strongly agree. These were questions like um, the workshop helped me become a better listener, more observant. It would help me take better care of patients. It helped me bond with my classmates. I would recommend the class to others. So uh, overwhelmingly uh, um, uh, positive. The areas of more brown, uh, there was one question about like a vivid module to help teach you about systemic inequities, where about a third of the students said so which maybe I was expecting as we were doing mostly work at the interpersonal bias level. Uh, interestingly, about a third of the students reported feeling stressed during the module, although 100% all of them felt that the module was safe. So we actually think the stress is probably a good thing. There's some of the stress involved in like public speaking and presenting, then also the stress of having discussions about bias and um, uh, self-insight. So this constructive tension that, that um, Dr. King talks about. Uh, qualitative themes went to one of these three buckets, self-identity, misperceptions, and endangered biases, safe space, and the value of stand-up in the non-medical context. So, for example, one student said, I greatly appreciated having the opportunity to think about how I perceive myself and how others perceive me in a structured context. I feel that this is very important to breaking down my role in the clinical encounter. So self-identity, race, and privilege was a critical factor. One of the white students said, this was a helpful reminder that I am not often forced to think about how people perceive me because I am in the dominant racial group, and thus I am afforded the privilege of unselfconsciousness. I'm not going to present this today, but we also did qualitative interviews of about 19 students, and this was also one of the themes that, that some of the white students um, you know, talked about, like uh, they, they someone's had the privilege of not having to worry uh, about uh, identity uh, because of um, their position. I think it forced me to confront uh, my own blindness regarding others' perceptions of myself. This module made me reflect deeply on how difficult it is to separate others' perceptions of me from my own identity and how substance can have a huge and often harmful impact on people. And one of the key perceptions in this model is like Monica's paper, Everyone's individual stories definitely highlight the way in which other people's perceptions and assumptions of us can shape our own self-perception. So again, it's hard to have a clean view of yourself that is affected by others, and those particular views are tainted by society's uh, stereotypes and, and, and images. The security is important to understanding the barriers of care for each individual patient. I like that this module made us get uncomfortable in a safe space and reflect on questions about perception and assumptions. It was also really fun to be a part of. I love Mona's energy. I was, I was surprised by how much I enjoyed this session. It helped me reflect and learn more about my classmates' viewpoints and how perceptions affect our actions. This made stand-up comedy a little less intimidating, while at the same time increasing my awe to for stand-up comedians' storytelling abilities and resilience. I've realized that their work is indeed analogous to being a doctor, and I think it is good practice for increasing self-understanding. I think the more different ways we try to think about our differences and our perspectives aside from medicine, the more likely we are to internalize that lesson and in turn bring it back into medicine with us. So we conclude by saying that, that stand-up has a lot of potential and promise for engaging students in meaningful discussions about perceptions and interpersonal biases rooted in their own personal experiences and those of their classmates. A point that Mona keeps on, on emphasizing to me is, you know, be careful about getting too trapped in, in the conceptual models that for her, and I think she's right, it really comes down to heart, that uh, the power of, of these modules, I think for the stand-up and the other art forms that in our overall project, is that they tend to appeal and, and get into a person's heart uh, you got to do the mind as well as the heart, and the heart leads to some powerful change. Uh, we're in the process of writing a commentary on our wider group uh, for academic medicine, so thank you, uh, Laura Roberts, uh, talking about what we've learned from the four art forms, our pilot for teaching students about health equity. We're probably going to mention at least four uh, of, of these issues um, I'll mention right now. One is that um, 
students are heterogeneous. So the need to really be able to reach students with different readiness to change, different capacity, uh, different uh, willingness to think about issues such as race. Um, a second being that um, being very clear about the learning goals for each session. Some students could connect to docs very easily. Some students want to have uh, even more concrete uh, how this connected to clinical medicine. Uh, there's more we can do in terms of establishing safe, brave spaces. And then also uh, this theme about how um, there were like uh, uh, some differences uh, between uh, the white students and then the uh, students of color which uh, are going to be important to think through and, and, and uh, work with regarding the best way to structure exercises and the discussions. And so we live in contentious times, uh, a lot of partisanship and um, liberals and conservatives like David Brooks, like in today's paper, New York Times op-ed, um, talked about how community is important. So we end our paper by saying that in today's contentious times, Breaking down walls between people will require self-insight, honesty, and emotional connection, a key requirement for establishing effective clinician-patient communication and relationships across diverse populations. Look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marshall. It is always a pleasure being on the panel with you and learning from you. And it has been particularly wonderful um, watching you on this journey. Um, and watching you grow in this additional skill and how you've brought those skills to bear in the um, health equity work that you do. So thank you. Um, and again, I'd like to remind everyone, people have been putting uh, questions in the chat. Thank you um, for our prior speakers and I encourage you to continue to do so. Um, so now my time. <laughs> so um, my talk is entitled uh, Black Lives Matter, um, Racial Justice as a Critical Issue in Clinical Medical Ethics. And um, for any of you who have seen me talk in this lecture series or anywhere else, um, I normally have a whirlwind tour with more slides than I can squeeze into the time allotted um, <laughs> with lots of data. This is not that. I have very few slides um, and I, they're, mo they're mainly photos. And so what I want for us to do during this uh, period of time, and we, we may actually run short, which will give us just more time for the Q&A, is to um, slow down a bit and think more abstractly about where we are in space and time and what it means uh, historically, uh, how we have historically as a country valued black lives and what that has meant contemporarily as we value or devalue black lives and how that interfaces with different institutions, primarily our healthcare institution, um, and what that means for us as providers and clinicians, for healthcare systems, and ultimately for health inequities um, and um, clinical medical ethics. And so, um, so that's what we're, we're going to try and uh, dig into a little bit today. I'm gonna see if I have the technical skills to advance this on my cell phone, let's see. Ha, huh. okay, I did. So I uh, always want to start by acknowledging the various places that I sit on campus. Uh, today, the McLean Center, I'm honored to be an associate director here at McLean. Um, I also am part of the Buxbaum Institute, uh, the Chicago Center for the, uh, Diabetes uh, Translation Medicine, um, also this, uh, part of the Center for the Study of Race, Politics and Culture, who's um, logo is not here in many other places, so thank you. I'm going to remind us of what the definition is of clinical medical ethics um, because that's going to be the framework for uh, discussing this. So it's a medical field that helps patients, families, and health professionals reach good clinical decisions by taking into account um, the medical de details of the situation, the patient's personal preferences, values, socioeconomic considerations, and ethical concerns. It examines the ethical, I'm sorry, it also examines practical ethical concerns that arise routinely in encounters among patients, families, healthcare professionals, and healthcare institutions. Oh, I'm having some issues. Okay. So when uh, Black Lives Matter first started. 
Um, and these are just some samples of video of uh, pictures that that uh, came up. It has been controversial that 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 statement uh, since its onset. Um, and it arose out of uh, as a response to just generations of state sanctioned killing, meaning police killing of unarmed black people, primarily unarmed black men, um, but black people in general. Um, and as a response, black communities um, and have been protesting because that is the primary means that we have to um, express our concern about these issues. And, um, but there, there's, there's a lot of a dismay at, at, the, at the response and, and at the term Black Lives Matter. And so initially there was concern that this is not the time and place to protest. Um, this is not the way to do it. Um, so for example, you know, rioting and looting and burning things, that's, that's not the proper way. Or, you know, having clashes with the Proud Boys uh, or, you know, clashes with the police, you know, all of that is not advancing your cause. And, and but these things came a, a little later. And so it wasn't the initial uh, concern about the term Black Lives Matter. And each of these, I, I, I would argue, have validity in and of themselves. There's pushback I would give for each of those concerns. But putting those aside, um, th this is a, a cartoon that started when I was in medical school. It's a, it's a shout out to uh, Huey Newton. Um, but it says, we said Black Lives Matter. We never said only Black Lives Matter, or we never said Black Lives Matter more. Really what we're saying is that Black Lives Matter also, Black Lives Matter too. We know all lives matter, of course they do. But in the face of all the evidence <laughs> from the past and the current that is telling us that Black Lives don't matter, we want to say we're confirming for ourselves, for our community, for our children, that they do matter. And the fact that that is a controversial statement is more, speaks more to who we are as a country than who black people are in this country. So um, it reminded me of the sanitation workers in the civil rights movement, when they were, had their protests with, um, and they were holding signs that said, I am a man. I may have a job that is lowly, that may not be worthy of respect, but I am not lowly. I am worthy of respect. I am a full human. I'm not your boy. I am a man. And to have to say that I'm a whole person full of, you know, worthy of respect. And I have to put that on the sign. You know, black people have, since we have been here, fighting for our dignity and for our humanity. And to be able to, and to, to say that, you know, I, I'm just a human. I'm a man. I'm a person, my life matters. And to make a simple statement of affirmation of that and for that to be controversial, for that to bring out the police, the riot guard, the, you know, white nationalists and haters. What, what does that say about us as a country? That we can't just say that I'm, I'm a regular person too without all the vitriol coming out to meet us. I believe deep in my soul, <laughs> that it reflects that we have yet to come to terms with the fact that we do not see African Americans as fully human. We have yet to humanize black people in this country. And that is part of our history.
since we got here in the United States, we arrived as non-humans, as chattel uh, slavery. That's the worst kind of slavery. It's what we sort of traditionally know in this country. There are lots of different kinds of slavery. But chattel slavery is the, is the kind that, by its very definition, dehumanizes people. It takes you from any human agency at all to being no, nothing different than a, a piece of furniture or in those days, more akin to livestock, <laughs> some, you know, um, and being very uh, thought about as animal property. Um, and so that process of being thought of as, you know, not even really human. And for voting purposes, there was that, you know, how should we sort of figure this out? We want to give landowners and people owners, again, you know, these aren't really people, they're more like land or livestock, but we want to give more priority to the wealthy landowners in the South. So we'll consider their slaves three-fifths of a person. That affects the psyche for Blacks and whites about what the value of Black people is. They're three-fifths human. So really not fully human, maybe three-fifths for voting purposes, but that three-fifths has persisted in our common psyche about the lack of full humanity of black people in this country. So we get to George Floyd, um, who was one of many black people killed that year and the year prior. Um, and his brother said that this was a modern day lynching. People were like, what? <laughs> that seems so full of hyperbole. Um, but that is exactly what that was. Lynching is a public killing used for the purposes of intimidation and uh, racial control. His killing was in public. You see the disdain and uh, lack of concern by the police officers. You know that there was a crowd of black people watching who were in horror videotaping, but did not step in to it felt unable to intervene and save that man's life um, because they knew that they would probably be shot and killed. And this is what has happened generationally with typical lynchings. Um, black people were often forced to watch on plantations, other blacks be lynched, you know, killed. So they would not, so they would learn their lesson. Um, and to learn about their own powerlessness in being able to help others. Sometimes those lynchings were, um, often those lynchings were large, large events for the public. Um, and this is a picture of one of those. So which, what looks like maybe a cotton field is actually people, uh, thousands of people. And you see the shadow of the person being lynched. So during Reconstruction, um, which is really when it took off to 1950, which is not when lynching ended, there were lynchings that took place uh, during uh, the pandemic. Um, there are about 4,500 documented lynchings, which meant that there are many more that were undocumented. Um, and by definition, uh, it's any sort of public killing, but it, most commonly it was hanging, um, often preceded by torture um, and or people would be burned alive, but, um, and frequently uh, over a period of hours for the enjoyment of the, the public. And so they would be sort of attached to some sort of scaffolding and dipped into burning oil or some pit of fire and then pulled back out, you know, to be dipped back in and pulled back out and it would last for hours. Photos would be taken and sent around as postcards. Kids would come. It was, a, it was like going to a concert. Um, and the pretext for this was the idea that black people were subhuman. They didn't really feel pain and they were always sort of lurking around as a devolving species, uh, looking for, you know, uh, harm and violence and trying to rape white women. Um, and that sort of, that, that theory of the idea that of inherent violence um, of black people has persisted so much that ordinarily what we see is that police will shoot and say, I thought he had a weapon. 
and really there's no weapon found. What they thought or what they thought was a weapon was really just black skin. That's what they were afraid of. Um, and so what has become criminalized is black skin, not any weapon. Um, and so the, the legacy of lynching it has come in two forms. The disproportionate mass incarceration of young black men, um, which Dr. Scarlett talked about, um, and how that has played out and interfaces with our healthcare system, um, and the disproportionate police killings of unarmed black men, which um, led to a lot of the, the racial unrest during the pandemic over the past two years. This was a study that was published last month um, in the National Academy of Sciences. Um, from the University of Virginia that looked at the correlation between lynchings historically and Confederate monuments, which just goes to show how, where and what we value, the, the things that we hold dear, the, ide the ideas and the ideology, um, who we see um, and how uh, as, as valuable and not valuable, how those ideas are associated with our actions. And so the places where most of the lynchings were taking occurring or were the places where people felt the most proud about the Confederacy, which was all about slavery, <laughs> you know? And so these things are tightly linked. And so when we were seeing the, um, the removal of some of these monuments and then the pushback against that removal, um, there are reasons for that. Um, and so this is just something that I'll also add about the redlining that occurred that because this is not something that's just an individual issue. It's not just interpersonal racism. It's structural racism um, that our government had a lot to do with. So the racialized segregation that has put into play a lot of the current day structural inequities that we see started with depression era redlining um, where neighborhoods were considered high risk if they had black people in them. So again, badness associated with blackness, black people couldn't get a mortgage. And then the government specifically developed suburbs and gave white people um, a mortgage. And that fuel that started the ongoing investment and disinvestment in white and black communities re respectively. So since then, we've seen a lot of you know, efforts to try and push against that with efforts to try and get equal um, education, um, voting rights, equal access to goods and services. Um, yet we have not been successful today. This is a study um, in 2017 that showed that black children are still separate and unequal as far as being um, attending high poverty schools and largely racially segregated schools. And that has an impact on their performance. This is just one area and it's showing math performance in uh, uh, where uh, students are attending high poverty schools that are private, pre predominantly schools of color. And we're seeing uh, this year, these are pictures from this year, uh, a big pushback against voting rights that we thought had been settled. But since the election where Donald Trump did not win, um, there has been a sweeping effort across the country in states um, to try and turn back the ability for um, marginalized people, particularly black people, to vote. And we also have seen in symbols, actions, deeds, things that, again, underlie the idea that black, va that black lives are not valued. I'm trying to advance. Oops. Uh, so this is a study that is in press now at Health Affairs, uh, led by one of our Pritzker medical students, Michael Sun, with the senior author of Liz Tung. And we were looking at um, people here um, at our medical school, I mean, at our medical institution, and documenting the use of neg negative patient descriptors, um, aggressive, uh, non-compliant, et cetera, um, and found that there was around twice the odds of those being used for black people um, compared to non compared to white people um, over a period of time that spanned the pandemic. One of the good things that we found is that um, people who came in after March 1st um, in setting of a lot of this uh, awareness around racial 
uh, tension, race, structural racism actually had a lower odds um, of having negative descriptors applied. So perhaps some of that was being um, internalized by the uh, house staff and providers and was um, making a difference in how their things were being documented in the medical record. This um, is a, a, a figure from a paper a review paper about implicit bias that's being led by uh, Dr. Vela, uh, myself, and Dr. Chin are on that paper, and it's just showing uh, the cycle um, between how external forces uh, that structural inequities and structural racism drive, um, like disproportionate poverty and those kinds of things, how they infect how they affect individuals. So if you think about the red, that's the bad case. Um, and so what we do is we think we see how a person has been just rolled over by society um, and has all of these health problems. But as a provider, we just see that the person is sick and has all these social issues. And that can lead to biased decision making, which can lead to um, worse clinical care that we give that person and then confirm the biases that uh, we have about that person. Like, oh, they, it turns out that the things didn't really work out so well for them. Um, and so if we have a different person who's experiencing uh, different kinds of, uh, uh, if their environment is different, um, where they're living in a safe environment, where they have healthy food, where they have all these wonderful things, they're gonna have better health outcomes and be seen differently by that provider. And so what we need to try and do is have more equity in the environment to help mitigate some of these biases. Um, but we cannot do that until we start thinking about the ultimate humanity of who's, of, of black people um, and think about whose lives matter. If we continue to subconsciously think that it's okay that some people have less than others, that some lives don't really count as much, then we're it, then then this kinds of uh, two systems of care, two systems of living, uh, will continue to be perpetuated in our country in our lifetime, um, and we'll continue to have health equities. Um, we'll continue to have uh, differences in the way that we care for people, um, and and things will not change. This last slide um, is, oops. Um, a shout out to what Marshall showed earlier. Um, just how sharing in power and sharing in decisions um, really is more than just the desire to share information, but it, it, it's largely impacted a lot by um, the biases that we carry and our perceptions about each other. So just a final reminder about how we're defining uh, clinical medical ethics um, and how ultimately we are valuing black people, how we value everyone, but today, how we're thinking about valuing black lives and how just saying that black lives matter should not be a controversial thing. It shouldn't be something that we all want to affirm today. Um, and that if we can't begin to do that without controversy, then I think we have much farther to go than we think we do. Um, and with that, I will um, end my talk and now uh, try to introduce Dr. Selwyn Rogers, who is a widely respected surgeon. We are so happy to have him at the University of Chicago. He's also a public health expert. Um, he's the founding director of the University of Chicago Medicine's Trauma Center. Dr. Rogers is building an interdisciplinary team of specialists to treat patients who suffer injury from life-threatening events, such as car crashes, serious falls, and gun violence. His team works with leaders in the city's trauma network to expand trauma care on the south side, which has long been a trauma desert before Dr. Rogers and his team came. Dr. Rogers has served in leadership capacities at health centers across the country, including most recently as vice president and chief medical officer for the University of Texas Medical Branch at Galveston. Dr. Rogers has also served as the chair of surgery at Temple University School of Medicine and as the division chief of trauma, burns, and, and surgical critical care at Harvard Medical School. While at Brigham and the Women's Hospital, he helped launch the Center for Surgery and Public Health to understand the nature, quality, and utilization of surgical care nationally and internationally.
Dr. Rogers' clinical and research interests focus on understanding the healthcare needs of underserved populations. He has published numerous articles relating to health disparities and the impact of race and ethnicity on surgical outcomes. Welcome, Dr. Rogers. At the peak, thank you so much. Uh, Monica, it's been a pleasure. Um, and thanks uh, for setting um, my talk up so well. Um, it's really going to be uh, a privilege to um, join this panel, but also uh, I want to echo uh, Monica Marshall's comments earlier. I want to thank uh, Dr. Siegler for all of his efforts uh, over the you know, more than four decades uh, in his work related to clinical medical ethics and his commitment to um, advancing this field. So if I can get my first slide, I, I want to uh, start off by, um, you know, some of the reasons why we're here today virtually, uh, I don't have to tell uh, this room, is related to the global pandemic. We've had uh, over 750,000 Americans who have um, died from COVID-19, um, and uh, it's probably been the dominant um, historical event for the past 22 months. But there's been another pandemic, uh, the pandemic of violence. Um, we've seen that throughout the United States uh, for the past several decades, but especially uh, over the past year and a half. Um, it's led to discussions about having federal troops in cities like Chicago uh, and, and L.A. Uh, it's led to lots of discussions about what the solutions are um, as well as the impact that it has upon communities. But I want to frame this in the context of a important ethical principle, that of justice. Um, justice is defined as, as we have an obligation to provide others what they're owed or deserved, impose no unfair burdens, and look at the distribution of limited resource. With respect to intentional violence in the city of Chicago, uh, this is a schematic from 2014 from the uh, Chicago Tribune that looked at the fact that for three decades, there was no adult trauma hospital on the south side of Chicago. Um, you can see this is a smattering of where gunshot wounds are, gunshot injuries and victims are over the, um, over the past uh, several decades. And notably, there had not been a adult level one trauma center in the south side of Chicago uh, since 1991. The lack of access to adult trauma care was highly controversial, but a great deal of community advocacy for adult trauma services. If you look at uh, the city of Chicago, about a third of Chicago's homicides and violent crimes occur within five miles of New York Chicago uh, Medical Center and with a homicide rate in the five mile catchment area, three times the rest of Chicago. So in some ways, this is an issue of equity and an issue of, of justice. Before the level one trauma center at New York Chicago Medicine opened, uh, there was a relative trauma desert, as Monica alluded to, on the south side of Chicago. Um, with the advent of the trauma center in May of 18, 2018, uh, that trauma desert has been effectively um, reduced. But with respect to trauma care, that's after the event happens, uh, after the violent injury, um, which is a center area. Uh, we talk a fair bit about um, hospital care, pre-hospital care, um, rehabilitation and recovery, but we often don't focus on the upstream uh, factors such as people's lived experience and the built environment. By built environment, I mean the areas where people live, work, love and play, and how that infrastructure, be it schools, businesses, quality of housing, public spaces, and connectivity affects their health outcomes. If you look in the city of Chicago uh, at unemployment rates, the unemployment rates are the nothing. highest in communities of color, particularly among black and brown communities on the south and west sides of the city of Chicago. Similarly, if you look at economic hardship index, uh, there are the highest um, hardship index is found in the south and west sides of the city. Similarly, um, if you look at high school graduation rates, they're um, much lower, uh, where one third of, of adults have not graduated in high schools and communities in the south and west sides of the city as well. And finally, something structural 
like housing levels and the housing stock, there's elevated blood levels in many of the communities in the south and west sides compared to other parts of the city of Chicago. And it's not surprising, therefore, if, if you relate that um, rate of uh, economic and social factors, that that's also linked and correlates with higher rates of shootings on the south and west sides. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that some more uh, shortly when I look at the solutions. Thus, gun violence is complex. We may focus on the <clears throat> final event, the shooting, uh, and how that impacts the individual who is injured, um, as well as the downstream impacts to that individual with respect to their individual recovery, um, post-traumatic stress disorder, um, but also their acts of retribution um, and retaliation. But if you look upstream, there's so many environmental factors, such as the impact of racism, segregation, educational disparities, economic outlook, and how that affects the ultimate outcome of being a victim or a perpetrator of violence. Transitioning a bit, and I'm going to link the two shortly, uh, we've seen COVID-19 affect the entire world with over 6 million that's globally, and 750,000 Americans who have died. But the impact upon African Americans has been disproportionate. Of the um, first wave of reports related to uh, the share of COVID-19 deaths, over 69% of deaths were among African Americans in the city of Chicago, even though they only represented 30% of the population. This trend occurred nationally with similar rates of high, similar high rates of both being diagnosed with COVID-19 and suffering death and disability from COVID-19 being higher among Latin, uh, Hispanic populations and African American populations throughout the United States. Here in the city of Chicago, we know that there are significant racial and ethnic geographic clustering. If the green arrow, the green uh, communities, uh, zip codes are primarily African American communities. The orange represents primarily Hispanic communities. And if you ha have a visual memory of what the maps before showing economic deprivation, they overlap in the areas of the black and brown communities in Chicago. When you, we look at COVID-19 mortality, similarly, the burden has been disproportionately borne by African-American and Hispanic populations in the city of Chicago. And the natural question is to ask, why? This brings up the central issue of equity or lack of health equity. Health equity is a principle underlying a commitment to reduce and ultimately eliminate disparities in health and social determinants of health. And pursuing health equity strives for the highest possible standard of health for all people, and giving special attention to the needs of those at greatest risk of poor health based on social conditions. In essence, this is an issue of, of justice. Equality is on the left, equity is on the right, where you uh, lift up the needs of those who are less advantaged or disenfranchised in order to achieve equal outcomes. When we look at the world, the impact of lack of equity, it manifests as healthcare disparities, which are differences in the quality of healthcare based on racial, ethnic, language, wealth, education, or gender that are not due to clinical needs, preferences, or appropriateness appropriateness of interventions. And it's the it's a lack of equity that drives healthcare disparities in the United States. This lack of equity manifests most dramatically in place-based mortality differences. In the in the Streeterville area, the average life expectancy in Chicago is on the order of 85 years of life, uh, compared to Washington Park, which is just you know half a mile from the University of Chicago, where the average life expectancy is 69 years of age, eight miles separating a 16-year life expectancy gap that continues to grow and has actually been exacerbated by COVID-19. 
This gap is driven by structural inequities, uh, such as res as Monica um, related residential segregation, impact of community violence, food, relative food deserts, limited built environment, and the, um, the critical impact of racial discrimination and racism, as well as impact upon poor housing. All of these factors relate to um, health, poor health outcomes, such as poor health outcomes related to obesity and diabetes, hypertension, um, chronic lung disease, cardiovascular disease, and asthma. And obviously, all of those factors lead to higher rates of mortality. So to relate the two, you know, we've had a very robust public health approach to COVID-19. And before the advent of effective vaccines that we have now, um, we basically use public health measures, social distancing, hand washing, um, contact tracing in order to lessen the impact of COVID-19 upon the population. If I apply the same a public health approach to intentional violence, we have an opportunity to make an impact there and what may seem like an intractable problem as well. But what is public health? It's the science of protecting the safety and improving the health of communities through education, policy making, and research for disease and injury prevention. And ultimately, that will lead to a healthier community. Dr. Peek and I published an article looking at using a public health approach to COVID-19 with respect to addressing the Im disproportionate impact of African-American disparities. And the plan basically took a recommended taking a public health approach, which involves these seven aims. Required a collection of race ethnicity data because what you can't, you can't affect what you can't measure. Utilize risk and place-based strategies to decrease COVID-19 exposure but also use that same risk and place-based strategy to increase COVID-19 testing. Um, we purpose our current resources for prevention, support, and monitoring. Isolate and support COVID-19 patients from high-risk living conditions in order to prevent recurrent transmission. Implement city and statewide protocols to share resources and patients. And then finally, allocate scarce resources to reduce inequities. Basically apply the resources where they're most needed in order to have a lasting impact. Similarly, framing public health as, a, as an approach for uh, addressing intentional violence will require three different approaches um, deemed primary, secondary, and tertiary. Primary prevention involves basically addressing issues around gun safety, uh, improving social conditions, improving mental health care, and reducing substance use and treat and providing greater sources of treatment. Secondary prevention involves areas of creating violence prevention programs, violence recovery programs, and the use of violence interrupters and community outreach workers to help prevent retaliatory violence, basically interrupt the cycle of violence, uh, especially related to re um, retribution or retaliation. And finally, tertiary um, is what we have mostly focused on um, because it's the most proximate, but is the last um, intervention. It's really after people have been injured, trying to reduce the impact of that injury. Um, we need to try to transition from thinking only about tertiary care um, with respect to providing uh, care after injury and looking upstream at primary and secondary prevention. I look forward to um, the panel discussion, but basically my part in comments relate to the fact that we need to, we really need to reevaluate how we think about equity. We need to embed equity in all of our systems be it education, criminal justice, health, legal, uh, education, all aspects. It needs to be facilitated across all our institutions um, and in partnership with the communities that we all live uh, and breathe within. Um, I want to thank um, Dr. Siegler again, and I look forward to our panel discussion.
Thank you so much, Dr. Rogers. I always learn so much from you. Um, now I am privileged to introduce Dr. Preston Reynolds. She is a clinician, educator, scholar, and tenured professor of medicine at the University of Virginia. She's been recognized with awards such as the UVA Martin Luther King Jr. Award and Mastership in the, U and the American College of Physicians for her work in human rights, medical professionalism, and the history of American medicine. She was a founding member of Physicians for Human Rights and served on the board of directors from 1986 to 2002. In 1997, Dr. Re uh, Reynolds was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. As a medical historian, she has focused her work on the history of race discrimination in healthcare delivery and health professions education, principally in the United States. She was named to the President's Commission on the University, um, um, on the University in the Era of Segregation and is currently researching the history of structural racism in medicine at UVA Hospital and its health profession schools. Dr. Reynolds recently completed a two-year term as president of the Academy of Professionalism in Healthcare. She now serves as director of APC, APHC's faculty development program, Leadership Excellence in Educating for Professionalism. Since 2016, she also serves as medical director of the Albemarle Charlottesville Regional Jail. That is amazing. <laughs> that was so much. Dr. Reynolds, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Monica. Uh, I'm going to try to advance my slides. Okay, good. So I, uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I have to make one correction. I was not awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, Physicians for Human Rights, as one of six organizations that were founders of the International Can to Campaign to Ban Landmines, was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, and as a member of the board, and a founding member of the campaign, I enjoyed and celebrated that accomplishment. Uh, as you heard, I am a uh, medical director of the jail. Um, and I do want to thank Mark Siegler, as well as the McLean Center, for giving me the opportunity to really study ethics in action. And I also want to thank Mark for moving the McLean Center to not only dealing with clinical ethics, but ethics as it applies in the way we live our lives as professionals, particularly those that are of us who have grown up in human rights and are really committed to social justice. When I became medical director of the jail, one of the first things I was asked to do is address the fact that we had a transgender individual who was a woman who was in the area housed with men and the whole rape potential was ripe. And so approaching her with a lens of ethics, a lens of human rights, a lens of prevention of rape, really called upon all of my skills as a clinician, as well as an activist, as well as now a leader setting policies in our local jail. I really wanna shout out to Sarah Scarlett and her work on policies. Hopefully this talk will advance some of those conversations as we dig deeper into the issue of mass incarceration. COVID accentuated problems with healthcare for the incarcerated. And I want to highlight several resources if you're interested in diving deeper into this area. 13th is a documentary. It is really one of the best that's been produced. It draws heavily on Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow, which is a must. And there is the Prison Policy Initiative. So if you're interested in developing policies based on really good data analysis, I would encourage you to explore this website. And there is a new effort to accumulate better data on COVID and its impact on prisons, and that's called the COVID Prison Project. I'm using all of these resources for this talk as well as personal experience. We live in a capitalist society and I want us to remember that incarceration is part of the industrial complex. It is very big business in the United States. And as uh, the Prison Project estimates in its 2020 report, mass incarceration, the whole pie, we spend over $180 billion on the mass incarceration system. That includes 
lawyers, judges, court fees, administrative expenses, policing, and incarceration itself. And as you can see, the big ticket items are the judiciary, law enforcement, correctional facilities with expenditures on staff and health care. I'm trying to advance my slides. Uh, I'm not able to advance my slides. There we are. Okay. Uh, so the prison project uh, in its 2020 report shows that we have over 7,000 correctional facilities in this country. We're going to focus part of this conversation on the 3,137 local jails. It estimated in 2020 that we incarcerated over 2 million people in U.S. detention facilities. This does not include military prisons, civil commitment centers, state psychiatric hospitals, and prisons in U.S. territories. So where does the U.S. stand relative to other countries around the world? We are the world's most incarceration-crazy country. We incarcerate more than all Scandinavian European countries. We, we actually incarcerate more than all repressive regimes. And with China, China and the U.S. alone incarcerate one-third of the world's population who live behind bars. From a Black Lives Matter, it is really important to understand that our incarceration system occurred and started just after the freeing of the slaves in the form of what were called black codes that were passed by white legislatures. And these black codes were designed basically to incarcerate the newly freed slaves. It allowed vigilante or po early police forces to incarcerate the homeless, the jobless, and anyone that they perceived aimless and this actually created our first convict labor population that then were hired out to work the land that was now empty because the slaves had been freed in the South. So from a Black Lives Matter perspective, we really need to understand that our pro present problem of mass incarceration reflects 250 years of slavery followed by a brief period of 15 years of Reconstruction, which was followed by over 30 years of Jim Crow, followed by redlining that really was part of the institutional racism that we now are still trying to untangle. And as Michelle Alexander argues in her book, our present system of mass incarceration followed the civil rights movement and is the newest form of incarcerating what what Monica had talked about earlier is people of brown and black color. In this country, the growth of the incarceration population grew over 800% from the 1970s and early 1980s. And this was fueled primarily because of increasing sentences that were imposed on persons convicted of drug possession and drug dealing. And you see here the increase in that population, but also marked with some of the major points along the time trajectory with federal legislation. In 1985, joblessness and crack swept inner cities precisely at the moment that the fierce backlash against the civil rights movement was manifesting itself through the war on drugs. The Reagan administration actively moved to create a war on drugs and did so through a massive media campaign. The director of the Drug Enforcement Agency at Reagan's request went to New York City to enlist the media giant to craft a new narrative. And in June of 1986, Newsweek declared crack to be the biggest story since Vietnam and Watergate. And in August, Time magazine termed crack the issue of the year. And thousands of stories of crack flooded the airwaves and newsstands. And these stories had a clear racial subtext as they described crack babies, crack cores, and black neighborhoods as communities infested with violence, drug dealers, and crime. 
Upon this narrative came federal laws fueling massive growth in federal enforcement and the move of military equipment from federal stockpiles into local police departments and a slew of laws at the federal and local levels that granted police the right to search without warrants, stop and frisk, develop and implement SWAT teams that morphed into today's ongoing police brutality. Part of the problem also was longer sentencing for crack versus cocaine. It was 100 to 1 years if you were found in possession of crack or dealing with crack versus cocaine, which is the substance of the white community. Even though in 1910, the Fair Sentencing Act changed that ratio to 18 to 1, it is still perceived to be racially motivated and unfair. So when we think about neighborhoods, and as we've heard earlier, there was a 16-year difference in an eight-mile radius, I also want us to think about our neighborhoods as also predicting the risk of incarceration. It's no surprise that incarceration is now a problem of brown and black communities, which you can see here. One in three and one in six black and Latino men versus one in nine and one in 17. And for women, it's black women, one in 18, Latino, one in 45 versus all women, one in 56, or white women, one in 11. And you'll see this in any correctional facility in the country. So that despite the fact that violent crime and property crimes decrease, our incarceration population has exploded. And the question is, why? So part of it is what I wanted to talk about before, which is the problem of drugs. But also now I want to shift to talk about jails because I think our policies at the federal, local, state levels are driving our problems of incarceration that COVID has only accentuated and made more difficult to deal with. So jails are incarceration's front door. And while 600 persons enter prisons annually, 10.6 million people go to jail each year. And it's important to understand that in most correctional, in most jails, 60 to 75 percent of individuals are never convicted of a crime. So here we have these correctional facilities that have exploded in the population of people behind bars, many of whom are never convicted of a crime. Why? So part of the problem is the bail bond system. So the average price of a bail is set at $10,000, which is far beyond the means of most people to pay. So we have a bail bondsman who negotiates, usually people then are offered to pay one tenth or a thousand dollars. And that's a guarantee that that individual will show up in court. So they are arrested, they are put behind a correct facility, they are given a bond deal, if they can make that bail of $1,000, they're released back into the community with a guarantee that they will show up for their court date. But it's important to understand, and you can see this graph, that the increase in population in correct facilities is really because most individuals cannot make that pretrial bond payment. I'm trying to advance my slides. And here you see this increasing jump are all those individuals that are now incarcerated who are behind bars because of the bail issue. Bail accentuates community poverty. It also accentuates generational poverty. And so the graph at the bottom shows at the top, whites with no incarceration history, the lines on the bottom are of brown and black community members who have either never had a history of incarceration, but their generational wealth is lower, or those who have had a history of incarceration and their wealth is even lower. So poverty predicts bond failure. 
poverty predicts incarceration. So does illiteracy, and so does residential neighborhoods. Here you see the rise in arrest because of drug possession, not even drug dealing. And as you see in the middle section of the upper left-hand slide, local jails, about a third of the population of people in local jails are because of a drug possession charge. The next area that's really important to understand in this pro problem, as I try to advance my slides, <laughs> um, is the problem of technical violations. So while we think of parole and probation or pretrial supervision in the community as more lenient, often the conditions that are imposed on people that are on probation or on parole are so strict. They have to go to meetings. They have to pay fees. They have to maintain a job. Sometimes they have to pay child fees. And in individuals who are already living on the margins of the social determinants of health, maintaining these technical requirements is really perceived as onerous. So as you see in the yellow bars here, these are individuals who are reincarcerated, not for a new conviction or because of a new crime. It's because they have failed in meeting that technical violation. Misdemeanors also account for over 25 of the percent of the jail population. Something as simple as jaywalking. So now I want to move just quickly to talk about COVID. And it's important to understand that our legal system requires everybody in an incarceration environment to have access to comprehensive health care. As you see here, 750,000 people are incarcerated, but you also understand that there is a high flow of people in and out of correctional facilities. This is a COVID COVID prison project that estimates that almost 450,000 people in correctional facilities have come down with COVID. It's important to under, understand that these are individuals in prisons, not even jails. This is a study that documented for the first time in April through May of last year, some correctional facilities actually had access to COVID testing and could begin to understand the prevalence of COVID within their correctional facilities. So what did we do within our local jail? Well, in fact, we did not have our first case in the general population of our jail until September of this year. So there were three strategies. One was to reduce the population. And in fact, we were able, through a lot of advocacy and years of arguing, that this is what we should be doing anyways, that we were able to reduce our inmate population by 30%. Nonviolent offenders, parole violations, um, bail bond difficulties were removed to a home electronic monitoring. Unfortunately, we had to stop all entry of volunteers. We had to stop our work release program. We declined to accept new inmates from other facilities. And we had to reduce to a minimum the flow of inmates to UVA. All the area courts closed, and then they opened with Zoom. We had to really implement very strict mask mandates, PPE for all personnel working in intake with anybody who was coming in and out of the facility, mandatory uh, temperature testing early on. And then when COVID hit our staff, we had educated them really aggressively to stay home self-quarantine, get tested when testing became available. And you can imagine in a correct facility, we had to create a culture that talked about safety of the inmates as a number one priority. So what did we do with inmates? We had to implement actually mandatory quarantine be before we had the ability to test. So everybody was quarantined for 14 days. Once they were released into general population with no symptoms, they were kept in that area. When available, antibody testing was for everybody. We moved inmates with symptoms to medical and housed them in negative pressure room. And then when vaccinations became available, we have offered voluntarily vaccination. And I will 
say that we have over 50% of our inmate population who has received at least one vaccine. Was the public health department helpful? I will say absolutely not. CDC was not reliable and they were often incorrect. So we studied the literature, we talked to experts, and consistently we were two to four weeks ahead of expert recommendations. It's also important to understand that medical personnel in jail facilities were not considered essential personnel. So we didn't have access, early access to antibody testing, we didn't have early access to PPE, we had to rely on donated supplies and supplies we could get through the supply chain. And in fact, UVA early on refused to see our inmates, even though we were COVID free. What happened when Delta? While we had been really good at containing COVID within our facility, once Delta hit, we were really behind the eight ball. And we knew that. The Virginia Chief Justice allowed all the courts to open without mandatory masking. Myself, my health director, wrote a letter opposing those decisions. Charlottesville remasked all of the courts, but the area courts still remained open. And you can imagine after 12, 15 months of intensive mask wearing, even our officers were sometimes COVID fatigued and were not always adherent in wearing masks. So we did have our first case on 9-12 with somebody who had gone to a local courtroom, came back, exposed. Jen exposed it to other people in the population. We were able to get antibody testing of high-risk inmates at UVA. We created a COVID unit with daily visits, lung exams, asking the inmates to alert us if anybody had a change in symptoms. We had a massive review of our policies and procedures by the Department of Virginia, the Virginia Department of Health. And I could say that, in fact, I think we got four or five out of five stars. And we also have now have created mandatory COVID testing for all unvaccinated staff. So I want to end with this slide because what this group is really trying to do is to use COVID to drive policy changes in mass incarceration because of the public health risk. And if you're interested, I would really encourage you to go to the website and find more and learn more. Thanks. I'm sorry, I was muted. (laughs) So I'm gonna say that again. Um, Thank you so much, Dr. Reynolds. It is always a pleasure to hear from you. Um, I noted that even if you're not a Nobel Prize winner, it is is always a delight. Um, Thank you so much for your words. It was very powerful um, and just in line with um, all of our previous speakers today. It's though we knew what we were gonna be all talking about, but we didn't. Um, I'm delighted to now welcome Dr. Erin Sullivan DiMartino. She is a graduate of Williams College and Dartmouth Medical School, where she also completed internal medicine residency. She completed her pulmonary and critical care fellowship at the Mayo Clinic, where she's now on faculty as an assistant professor of medicine. She's a 2016 graduate of the McLean Center Fellowship in Clinical Medical Ethics. Since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, Dr. DiMartino has de- uh, divided her energy between frontline patient care and the medical ICU. Thank you for your service and serving on the Minnesota's Pandemic Ethics Task Forces. Thank you for your service again. Dr. DiMartino, welcome to the uh, panel. Thank you so much. So I have entitled my talk, Just Short of Crisis, Operating Under Contingency Conditions. I don't have any relevant financial disclosures. Today, I'll start with a brief history of triage and crisis standards of care and discuss challenges to those paradigms that we've encountered during the COVID-19 pandemic. And then I'm gonna end with some suggested adaptations in view of the challenges we've faced over the last year and a half plus. Mm 
So starting at the beginning of the 19th century, um, triage is a word that's actually derived from agriculture. It uh, has a French derivation, trier means to cull or to sort. And it was first appropriated for use in a medical setting during the Russian campaign of the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, one of the surgeons described how those who were dangerously wounded should receive the first attention without regard to rank or distinction. And that concept cross-pollinated, it, it crossed the Atlantic Ocean and, um, and was used in different theaters of war, including the American Civil War and eventually both world wars. It wasn't until the 1960s that the concept took root in uh, civilian medicine and the first systematic review was of triage in the emergency department was published in the early 1960s. In 1992, the Joint Commission required that all hospitals establish policies for situations in which the patient load exceed optimal operating capacity. Two events um, in the first decade of the 21st century magnified the importance of planning for public health crises, and those were the humanitarian crisis following Hurricane Katrina in 2006, and then the H1N1 pandemic. In contrast to triage, the term crisis standards of care has a very brief history, having first been proposed just 12 years ago. And here you can see a PubMed graphic of, um, of publications using this phrase within their titles. In 2009, during the H1N1 pandemic, the Institute of Medicine convened a special working gr group to put forth guidance for establishing crisis standards of care, which they suggested each state do. And they described crisis standards of care as a substantial change in the usual healthcare operations and the level of care it is possible to deliver, which is made necessary by a pervasive or catastrophic disaster. They further described it as the optimal level of health and medical care that can be delivered during a catastrophic event. Lest we forget, an important component or function of a crisis standard of care declaration as originally conceived is actually to protect healthcare workers. With a formal statewide de declaration of crisis standards of care, uh, healthcare workers are protected from liability stemming from allocation decisions or deviations from what is known as the conventional standard of care. Digging deeper into this recent history, we find that around 2009, 2010, there were a number of states who were beginning to draft their own scarce resource allocation or crisis standards of care policies. And as of March of 2020, 72% of states either had publicly available already released um, documents or they were in the process of developing them as we were um, bracing for and experiencing the first wave of the COVID-19 pandemic. Crisis standards of care are grounded in a concept of a surge continuum, which depicts this increasing imbalance between patient needs and available resources. Resources are often categorized in the emergency management literature as space, staff, and supplies. Under conventional conditions, usual patient care is provided in usual settings by usual staff with usual supplies. Um, under conventional conditions, care may occur in a repurposed setting, say an ICU patient receiving care in the PACU, the post anesthesia care unit. Staff may oversee care of more patients or practice outside their typical scope but with supervision, and supplies may be adapted or reused. The foundational assumption during um, contingency conditions is that of functional equivalence. Under crisis standards of care, patients receive care in non-patient care settings, trained staff cannot meet all the needs of patients, and critical supplies are lacking such that there is consideration at least for reallocation of life-sustaining therapies which may become appropriate. 
there is a commonly described shift in the balance away from individual patients' autonomy toward communitarian interests. The problem is there is no bright white line separating contingency and crisis conditions. In fact, it can be remarkably difficult to distinguish between them. We'll return to this point. When I reflect on the ethics community's early response to the COVID-19 pandemic, there's little doubt in my mind that we focused too much of our attention on crisis standards of care. We focused on generating triage protocols and for ventilator allocation, scarce resource allocation, uh, ethics guidance, and all of it was really, or the vast majority, was intended for use after an official declaration of crisis standards of care. So of the more than 3 million Americans who have been hospitalized with COVID-19 since the middle of, since the beginning of the pandemic, and the mil many millions more who have been hospitalized for other indications since March of 2020, most have received care in jurisdictions that weren't operating under crisis standards of care. An untold number of people have actually been cared for under some stringency or some degree of contingency conditions. Yet we have dedicated relatively little energy to ensuring fairness and transparency to patients under contingency conditions. I think two particularly salient examples are ongoing confusion around recognizing when we are in a crisis and publicizing that and how best to track some of the more dynamic parameters that influence what resources we can um, devote to patient care and specifically um, the trickiness of tracking staffing. I'm going to leave for the purposes of this talk um, to one side the many lessons we have learned about fairness and health equity from socializing the triage plans that were generated in the various states and institutions with the general public and the ways in which particularly the early iterations of crisis standards of care and triage plans perpetuated harm to at-risk communities. My focus for this talk is instead going to be on a quest for clarity about our position in the surge continuum at any one moment in time and how we uphold our values along the way. First, I'll start with the fact that some jurisdictions have already activated crisis standards of care and some are active at this moment. At various points in the pandemic, others have been active and inactivated. Um, Colorado being the most recent to reactivate their crisis standards of care policies through executive order earlier this week. States have taken different approaches to activating crisis standards of care, some with a general activation across the entire state impacting the whole population, at least theoretically, um, and others taking the approach, and this would include Colorado and Alaska, of authorizing individual healthcare entities to enact their own crisis standards of care policies but stopping short of enacting a crisis standard of care across the entire population of their state. And I'll just say that um, I wanna make a disclaimer that although this slide is useful in depicting kind of the prevalence and the various mechanisms and geographic distribution of these crisis standards of care declarations, it's um, very challenging to fully wrap your mind around or um, to, picked in full detail all of the declarations across the country. And so this may not be an exhaustive representation. In contrast, early in the pandemic, when I think clinicians looked to government leaders to make a formal declaration to help the, uh, our clinical staff make sense of dizzying conditions, I've actually come to regard this declaration of crisis standards of care as a blunt instrument to be exercised with great caution. Why? I think if we've learned anything is that conditions are constantly changing underfoot. So expansive a declaration may not accurately reflect conditions across the region or the state. A shortage of a particular piece of technology, for instance, dialysis circuits. While it may be dangerous for a certain subgroup of patients with renal failure, it may not have far-reaching applications for the entire population, 
whereas a severe shortage of critical care staff, nurses, would have much more far-reaching implications across the population. There are so many challenges here with communication. Communication with the public, worrying about a chilling effect of publicizing the um, strain on hospital resources where people are deferring potentially life-saving care for other, con other conditions, and potentially uh, balanced against the hope that setting expectation, realistic expectations about the type of care that someone might uh, expect to receive in the hospital, or even influencing behavior outside of the hospital around distancing and masking and vaccination. These are some of the tensions that are um, being negotiated by public health and public affairs. There's also a challenge of um, conveying to staff members where we are in this continuum and what that means for the care decisions that they're facing uh, with their own patients and they're navigating with their own patients. To my colleagues, um, to me and my colleagues in Minnesota, a core concept which we've grappled with is what even constitutes functional equivalence and how do we know we're meeting that standard? We've debated this definition for hundreds of hours, probably, collectively, and we've arrived here that there should be a reasonable expectation of equivalent outcomes for mortality and major morbidity. And in fact, we've um, published on the Minnesota Department of Health a 18-page document about the transitions between conventional contingency and crisis conditions. Um, we believe strongly that we can't just uh, state that we uh, expect to have a certain outcome. We need to be affirming, we need to be measuring to make sure that we haven't strayed toward crisis conditions unbeknownst to ourselves. So we need active surveillance around uh, excess mortality and degradation in standard patient safety protocols or uh, outcomes like central line infections, pressure ulcers, et cetera. So if we used to assume that contingency phase was something of an inexorable, maybe even unidirectional march toward a clearly demarcated state of scarcity known as crisis, how do we now conceive of the surge continuum? And a colleague and I uh, from the University of Minnesota, we um, kind of developed this graphic to help us wrap our minds around what we were discussing. We would say that specific resource scarcity, and here I'll use the example of a critical nursing shortage, might tip the balance toward crisis conditions. You can imagine that that would have a very impactful, uh, a very large impact on the health of the population, and yet it might be remediated or addressed within the course of hours with transferring staff from one site to another or bringing in travel nurses, et cetera. And so um, it's important to recognize the fluidity with which um, uh, the health system or region may fluctuate in and out of crisis conditions. We would argue that withdrawing or withholding or significant alteration in care that's motivated by scarcity isn't justified during contingency conditions. And yet withdrawing or withholding or significant alteration in care motivated by scarcity may, under narrow circumstances, be justified under crisis conditions. But we're worried about the conflation of scarcity and perceived inappropriate treatment. In other words, we're worried that clinicians recognizing system strain might use that to coerce or even force decisions to limit care on individuals who otherwise would have elected to receive that care while the system is still operating under contingency conditions. So we've been operating in some, some region of the gray zone off and on for much of the last two years. How are we doing it? So aside from the um, active mitigation strategies uh, that we have been described elsewhere about the extension models for staffing and conservation and substitution of supplies, we recommend expedited processes for um, conflict resolution. We recommend um, when a panel, a multidiscipline panel is not available to mitigate or um, opine on a specific resource scarcity, that a clinician 
document a second opinion about the resource scarcity uh, facing a particular patient. There need to be rapid bi-directional channels of communication between frontline staff and the health system so that um, uh, scarcities can be immediately recognized and intervened upon. And there needs to be coordination across the state, which we have um, in a critical care um, bed coordination system for load leveling. We're repurposing um, things that were originally conceived or of for use only under crisis standards of care, like multidisciplinary triage teams, which we trained last year, that can now convene to look at specific resource shortages. Um, it's important that any deviation of care that's been necessitated by scarcity is both documented and then retrospectively reviewed by oversight committees, again, for the purpose of detecting um, a stray into crisis conditions that isn't recognized by frontline staff. We need to be tracking our system strains, so metrics like excess all-cause mortality and even emergency department boarding time. And there need to be active engagement still with the community and efforts at um, transparently communicating where we are in terms of resource scarcity and what that might mean for their care were they to become sick. I'll conclude with uh, my fear. So my fear as an ethicist whose feet are firmly planted in the intensive care unit is for a degradation in the care of our patients. Our obligation is to uphold the highest standard of care, and I invoke that phrase intentionally for each patient, and it's never higher than when resources are the most strained. Our profession can't tolerate an erosion in the standard of care. We must always strive to provide the best, most patient-centered, individualized care that's possible within the constraints of resource limitation wherever we sit on the surge continuum. COVID-19 has shown that now is the time to double down on our values, the values that distinguish our profession and that have transcended centuries, and the challenges that are posed by this and whatever new challenge we face in the future. I'd like to just close by acknowledging the individuals and the groups that have influenced my um, thoughts around contingency care. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. DiMartino. That was an excellent presentation. Um, so much of this past two years has been spent in contingency care while we're thinking about crisis standards of care. And so I appreciate you sort of illuminating uh, these issues. That was fabulous. Um, our last speaker um, who I love dearly is Dr. Stacey Lindau. I'm so excited about what she's gonna share with us today. Uh, it's always fabulous. Um, Dr. Lindau is the Katherine Lindsay Dobson Professor of Obstet uh, Obstetrics and Gynecology and Professor of Medicine and Geriatrics, mm -hmm. as well as Palliative Care at the University of Chicago. And she's a practicing gynecologist with expertise in the preservation and recovery of female sexual function in the context of cancer and other complex illnesses. Dr. Lindau directs the Community Rx program of research, including several current current clinical trials focused on how and why connecting people and their caregivers to community-based resources drives health and well-being. Current trials focus on people with diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and caregivers of hospitalized children and home-dwelling persons with dementia. She also directs Feed First, a fully uh, self-serve, no barriers, medical center-based system to mitigate food insecurity triggered or exacerbated by living with or caring for people with illness. Dr. Lindau earned her master's degree in public policy at the University of Chicago, where she was also a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation clinical scholar. She is an Aspen Institute Health Innovators Fellow and a member of the Aspen Global Leadership Network. Dr. Lindau has been honored by her uh, academic and community-based peers for her community engagement and advocacy activities. Dr. Lindau, it is always a pleasure to spare, uh, share space with you. Um, I'll hand it over to you now. So thank you very much for the opportunity to share this work and to be with all of you. And I look forward to the passion.
Thank you so much, Dr. Lindau. Um, I am always inspired by the work that you do in all of your areas, um, be it food insecurity or women's health. Um, you are a supernova and I'm delighted to know you. We now have time to open the panel for a Q&A. Uh, so I'd like all of our panelists to be present. And just to remind everyone, um, we have Dr. Sarah Scarlett, um, Dr. Marshall Chen, myself, Dr. Selwyn Rogers, Dr. Preston Reynolds, Dr. Aaron DiMartino, and Dr. Stacey Lindau. We have, uh, thankfully, a lot of questions <laughs> to get us started. And so I'm going to start by asking one of you, uh, one question for each of you, and we'll see how we do on time. Um, Dr. Uh, I'll just call you by your first names, <laughs> Sarah. There are two questions that came in that were closely aligned around standards for care for persons that are incarcerated while they're in the hospital. One um, from Bernie Lowe asking if there's a role for the American Hospital Association or the AAMC in creating such standards for hospitals. Or another was uh, came in uh, from another person who said, well, the Supreme Court has mandated that these persons receive care. Shouldn't Congress have mandated um, standards around hospital policies for the ethical treatment? So is there, is there some space for the, uh, do these standards exist and they're just too low? Um, or is there space for additional agencies and organizations and laws and procedures and policies to step in and raise that floor a bit for um, incarcerated in individuals who are receiving care in their healthcare systems? Thank you for that question. Um, there are currently a very scant amount of policies offered by um, groups that are interested in correctional health, namely the National Consortium for Correctional Health Care. Um, there are definitely gaps in these um, policies. A lot of them refer to healthcare for people who are in correctional facilities. And I certainly think that there's a role, um, certainly among my colleagues, we have a significant interest in developing policies that could be used broadly to, um, to guide care. But it's definitely a huge gap in, in what exists right now. Okay, thank you. Um, Marshall, I have several questions for you. Um, but because we know and love John Lantos, you can pass on this. Um, but he is at, if, you, <laughs> if you'd be willing to give your 90 second introduction, um, because he's interested in knowing, um, how you are, you know, how you're perceived and then how you use comedy to address implicit bias. So if you would be willing to just do your 90 seconds right now. You can give a pass, and if you'd like to give a hard pass, then, <laughs> then I'll ask you some other questions. Yeah. Okay, John, this is for you. <laughs> so when people uh, meet me, um, they uh, will say after a while, like after they get to know me a little bit better, um, you're a lot more interesting than I thought you were, uh, which is sort of like a, a backhanded compliment that uh, when people first meet me, you know, I think they sort of see, think, well, you know, um, older Asian American man, um, very technical, very reserved, um, um, not into emotion, uh, not very interesting. Um, they think they're stereotypes in terms of, um, um, you know, uh, growing up, I got like a lot of the, oh, the Bruce Lee Kung Fu type of, 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 of taunting or, you know, uh, everyone always associates me with like, like Sulu and, and, and science and all. Um, so, you know, uh, people have like a, a superficial understanding, which I think it reflects then like the media images people see or um, the stereotypes we have in society. And as they get to know me better, well, they see that I have different sides. I like science. Um, I like emotion. Um, uh, I like a variety of different things. I actually did a yellow belt in, in, in uh, um, Taekwondo from way back. Um, and then I have my other stuff. I mean, it's, people get surprised when they find out do the improv and stand up, for example. So, you know, we're all complex and we all understand each other on the surface. So, thank you for the description. Um, even though you've passed on the actual improv bit. Um, so. <laughs> <laughs> Marshall is right. Um, okay, so there are a few questions for me. Um, 
And I'll take the one um, from Dr. Miller about the role of allies in this work. Um, and I cannot underscore the importance of that. Um, and so that's why I've chosen to sort of tackle this one. It, uh, we will not move forward um, as a community or as a country until everybody's at the table. Um, and that's, <laughs> that's partially because the people who have the power to move us forward um, are the ones who boot heel is on black people's neck. And so <laughs> if they would lift that up a little bit, we can breathe some more um, and um, be able to sort of stand up more strongly. But, but honestly, <clears throat> we, um, you know, there's a, there's a space for everyone. This is not only a problem of marginalized communities. Um, and so it's not black people versus white people. This is, you know, a community of people who are concerned about how structural racism impacts everyone. It impacts everyone. Um, and how we are going to try to work against that. Um, and work against those who are not interested in moving forward and having progress. The, that's the the who's against who, um, not not separated by you know clusters of racial groups. Um, we need to all come together and decide that this is important. Um, and particularly because allies have access to spaces and places and people that um, minoritized communities don't. You know, I don't hear the things. In some ways, thank God, um, that are said about me in quiet spaces. Um, I don't have access to some of the uh, things that are happening, but allies do um, and can um, take a stand um, and can do things in, in ways that I cannot. And the load is very heavy. Like, give me a break sometimes. I, you know, like, take some of this away from me. I, I you know, I could use a nap. And so, there's so many different reasons uh, that allies are a critical part of this struggle um, that I um, always want to make sure that I include that in my story and narrative. And so thank you, Dr. Miller, for the opportunity um, to, to highlight that as well. Um, I will move on to Eileen. Uh, lots of questions for you about vaccines in the prison system. Um, and why are the rates so low? 50% uh, seems pretty low. Um, what are your thoughts about vaccine research um, in the prison system? And so maybe you can just comment on, that, on, on some of those things. So thank you for the question. Uh, first of all, I'm gonna say that my local jail on the street the word on the street is if you want medical care, dental care, mental health care, get arrested because you'll get whatever you need if you get to jail. Um, and we are really, really committed to delivering on what the Supreme Court has mandated, which is comprehensive care. So everyone gets a comprehensive intake physical, everyone gets a dental examination, everyone gets access to professionally trained mental health uh, professionals. Um, and we're able to do that because our superintendent has made a commitment for as long as I've been there to lobby every time he can with the board of supervisors to get the resources necessary for us to do the job that we do. Secondly, we cannot do what we do, which is HIV care, hepatitis C care, trauma care without the help of UVA. And the National Correction Accreditation System has come in and they said they've really never seen any other correctional facility in the Commonwealth that has such incredible relationships with a source of specialized care. So that said, um, we were the last correctional facility in the state of Virginia to get vaccinations. Um, because we had done such a phenomenal job in keeping the correctional facility COVID-free. The correctional system simply wouldn't give us um, vaccinations, even though all the other correctional facilities had gotten them. And even though we had been lobbying and lobbying and lobbying and lobbying, uh, we now have Moderna, Johnson, Pfizer, and it's 
voluntary. We cannot mandate vaccinations. And so we have made vaccinations available to everyone who wants them. Uh, we don't require it. Uh, we offer them one of three. They can choose what they want. We also, as you can imagine, um, had a retraction in our healthcare staff. We had a retraction of the correctional also for staff. So we now have been doing COVID vaccinations not only with our inmates, our what I call our patients, but we've also been doing with our per personnel as well as our correctional officers. So we have been the source of vaccinations for everyone. We now do N95 fit testing for our correctional officers, which was not available. So we had to be specially trained to do that. Um, and in fact, it's interesting because we're now having inmates say, well, I got arrested so that I could come in and get my vaccination in the correctional facility. So I don't think that that's a compliment to us. I think that's an indictment of the community uh, in not making the necessary resources available to do community-based mental health, community-based uh, you know, drug treatment and all the other things that we do. But since we are charged by the Supreme Court to provide comprehensive health care, we do the best job we can because our superintendent, our board of advisors, and our community is willing to spend the resources to make sure that that's available. And I think that's probably why you're seeing policies in hospital care different, because not all hospitals are safety net hospitals. And so they will treat that inmate who doesn't have access to public funding um, accessing the kind of treatment that standard of care would require. We on the correctional side in Charlottesville mandate that when our inmates are inside the UVA health system. That is so incredible. So much. <laughs> so it's so a way to live care. ethics and human rights, even though you're inside a correctional facility. It's like, uh, you know, I want to change these policies. I want to keep people out. I know that we could have a third less people at any point in time because we've been able to use COVID to achieve that. But it's also using that position of social justice and advocacy mm -hmm. to make sure that people that we take care of get the care they need. Yeah. And if everyone on the outside could do their job, you wouldn't see people trying to get into the system to get basic care. Human like needs. in COVID, the homeless were put in hotels and the alcoholics exactly. were put in hotels. They were not housed in correctional facilities because people wanted them off the street. And so right. our broader community conversation has to change to find alternatives to incarceration and other systems of support. Yes. Aaron, um, there are a couple of, you had lots of uh, comments and positive questions and just lots of love. Um, you had two questions that were along the same line. So I'm going to ask you uh, about this. Um, how do crisis standards of care consister, consider systemic health inequity um, issues um, mentioned by Dr. Peek and Rogers? Um, can you speak to distributive justice for these utility focused guidelines? Yes, that's a really important question um, and a, a focus of my some of my other research. So thank you for asking this question. Um, obviously, there is a huge spectrum in how crisis standards of care have been developed across the country. And uh, we're still learning about the variation um, from both state to state, but also um, regions and institutions who have developed their own policies. Um, one prevailing concern has been around the fact that many of these policies were uh, generated in haste and more or less in a vacuum with a number of experts sitting at the table. But to, to Dr. Peek's, um, or well, actually around Zoom for the most part, but to Dr. Peek's point, there was at first maybe not an intentional effort to include populations that might um, be at the losing end of some of the algorithms and equations that were being um, promoted as ways of actually enhancing fairness and equity uh, and uh, leveling a playing field. That, um, and I know that 
your own Dr. Parker has spoken and will speak on this topic again, I think tomorrow. And so you'll be hearing more about this from him as well. But um, there are, I would just echo the fact that there are a lot of concerns with the ways in which chronic medical conditions and um, disability uh, have factored into um, supposedly um, objective scoring systems for allocating scarce medical resources. Yes, uh, thank you, thank you. Um, Stacy. Uh, there are t uh, some comments around uh, the troubling issue of, I mean, there's always troubling when we talk about unwanted sex. Um, so one person asked, is it a common occurrence to find the disclosure of abuse? And if so, what are the obligations of a researcher when you do find that? And then I'm gonna to toss this other one in at the same time. Um, they were uh, Someone asked about the taxonomy. And when you had uh, your sort of two by two table, the upper left quadrant where someone may want sex, um, but it's not consensual. And so still defining that as rape. They wondered if another term might be used instead of rape, and that would be a power differential. And so I wanted to get your thoughts on that. You're muted. Oh, can, can we right, unmute? There we go. Okay. okay. There we, I probably was able to do it on my end. Thank you. Um, with respect to the first question, no, it, it's not common. Well, first of all, most population-based surveys or population-based surveys, especially where sex is the topic, in my, uh, to my knowledge, rarely um, invite open-ended or, or qualitative type comments. Um, in this case, we were surveying adults, people 18 and older, and we know from clinical care of women that even if a woman an adult person discloses um, rape or sexual assault, um, ultimately the decision is the individuals with respect to reporting. Um, the case is different when we are caring for minors and also, um, and their law varies across states, but when we're talking about violation of a person 65 years or older. In this case, the quote comes from an individual who identifies as 19 years old. Um, it's terribly troubling. The survey itself did point to resources because we were querying a number of uh, vulnerable uh, areas. And so uh, the hope would be that the individual would, um, would seek help. Uh, but it's, it's in some ways uh, perhaps a false hope. We know that interpersonal violence, including intimate partner violence, domestic violence, um, was on the rise in the early pandemic. Um, studies are, are limited in terms of the quality of data that tells us what happens in people's homes um, during the pandemic, but um, there are very substantial reasons for concern that people, especially women, were at increased um, risk of, of rape and, and coerced sex uh, during the course of the pandemic. The other question is, um, is a big one, and uh, the literature on unwanted sex is relatively scant. Um, much of it happens in the HIV uh, space, including some of my earliest work where we were interviewing women who had given birth um, knowing of their HIV status. They had given birth uh, two or more times following knowledge of their HIV status. And actually one of the discoveries from that trial or that study um, reminds me of a, of a point that Preston made and, and Monica commented on. Um, and it was a quote from a person who said, HIV is the best thing that ever happened to me. Why? Because for the first time there was a place for her. Her identity as a woman with HIV availed her the services and support of the core center here in Chicago. And, and just like, you know, it, it's an absolute tragedy that, um, you know, imprisonment could be a better scenario for an individual than, than living in the community. Um, you know, 
that HIV could be a, a better life for somebody than life without it because of the services they're availed is just an absolute uh, uh, travesty. Um, to the point about the, you know, should we call it power differential versus rape? Well, um, I, you know, obviously <laughs> this is a asynchronous discussion on a very charged and important topic, but let me just reference Illinois state law which says that consent means freely given agreement to the act of sexual penetration or conduct um, in question, lack of verbal or physical resistance or submission by the victim resulting from the use of force or threat of force by the accused shall not constitute consent. So we do have you know, a challenging situation where a person may um, feel that they're not consenting to sex but they are subject to the coercion of the other individual um, in the form of you know, being able to meet basic material needs. And one, one factor that got me interested in this topic was my experience caring for women with cancer. My observation is that my clinic has been more full and better attended with women with cancer who are seeking help for their sexual function during the, the biggest economic downturns we've seen, including the COVID-19 pandemic. Why? Many of my patients say sex is extraordinarily painful. I have no libido or interest, but if I can't have sex, my partner's going to leave me. And then my children and I will, you know, I will have cancer and I will be homeless. So are they having non-consensual sex or are they having extraordinarily painful sex um, that they don't want in exchange for basic material needs? That was the hypothesis. And um, whether we call that rape or whether we just acknowledge that to be a severe threat to the integrity of a person and their body, uh, either way, cause for concern um, and attention. Thank you, everyone, um, for this really uh, meaningful and powerful uh, session. We are out of time. Um, We've been here chugging along for quite a bit of time, um, and I feel like we could, we've could we only begun to really scratch the surface. Um, thank you for everyone in the audience for hanging in there with us for your very thoughtful questions. Yes, uh, people have asked several times, will our presentations be made available? Um, and uh, if all, I, I said yes, and I, I think probably most of the presenters um, have agreed to have their presentations made available as well. So. No worries. Um, they're usually up um, available online uh, in the not too distant future. Um, so thank you all for joining us. Um, and uh, thank you to my wonderful panelists. As always, it's a pleasure uh, to share time and space with you, even virtually. Um, and for uh, thank you for Dr. Siegler for the 33rd um, conference. And, uh, yay. and I look forward to uh, the rest of the session. Um, so. That's it. Thank you, everyone.